afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for our administrative review prep webinar. Um, I'd like to kick us off uh, with a couple of quick introductions. I'm uh, Mike Munum, the Director of Sales here at Lunch Assist. Uh, we've got our host today, Emma Finn. Emma is our Communications and Training Coordinator. Uh, we also have our CEO and founder of Lunch Assist, Jen McNeil. And lastly, I would like to welcome today's special guest, Melissa Manning with My School RD. Um, Melissa, can you uh, take a, oh, and I also want to welcome the rest of the Lunch Assist team that's joining us on the call today. They'll be in the chat. They'll be answering questions, as well as Catherine Carnitz, who's uh, manning the Zoom controls for us. Um, Melissa, can you go ahead and take a moment real quick to say hi to everyone and tell them a little bit about um, My School RD? Sure. Thanks for inviting me to this session. Jen and I usually present each year at the CDE conference, but this year we're doing it this style on webinar. Um, I am the owner founder of My School RD. I've been working as a consultant in school nutrition for over 20 years, and I was a previous CDE menu auditor. And so I honestly really enjoy the audits. It is great to be able to take a look at a menu and go boom, boom, boom. Let's not do those. Let's shift that and uh, save you a lot of work and time on something that could go wrong. I also work in about 10 different software programs doing menu planning. So menus and uh, special diets are my specialty. Awesome. Well, thank you, Melissa. We appreciate the, the uh, background on, on you and your business. Um, I also want to go ahead and let everybody know, please, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Our team will be monitoring and answering questions as we go, but we also like for you guys to stick around. At the end of the presentation, we're going to do a quick little Q&A to ask some questions live. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Emma to kick us off. Emma? Thank you so much, Mike, and welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about administrative reviews. Uh, now, back in March, we did an episode of The Lunch Break, all about the AR. During that call, Jen gave us a great overview of the AR process and shared some best practices for completing the offsite assessment tool, the month of review, targeted week of menu review, on-site meal observation, et cetera, et cetera. We covered a lot, but we still get a lot of questions about it. After all, it is quite a monster, nearly impossible to cover in 30 minutes, uh, and there's so many nuances throughout the whole process. So today, I thought we could do a little refresher uh, and then really dig deep into some of the frequently asked questions that we get from school districts that we work with. How does that sound, Jen and Melissa? Good on that? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. All right, well, let's kick us off uh, by just going through the steps. What do people need to know about the administrative review? Yeah, let's talk about the, the steps of the AR. So um, we kind of have a few basics that we like to go over when we talk about the AR. Um, and I want to preface this by letting everyone know that um, we're going to kind of be talking a lot about some California specifics, but it is a USDA process. So if you're joining us from another state, just know that most of what we talk about is relevant across the country, but some of the things like the timeline um, and some of the like little nuances, we'll try to note when it's like, oh, this is more of like a California emphasis. Um, so just take some of that with a grain of salt if you're coming from another state. Um, but in California and probably in a lot of other states, um, most of the review lists are sent out like at the start of the school year. So in California, we got our review list in July. Um, so you can check um, the link, we'll put it in the chat if you are on review this year. So that's super helpful um, to, to kind of start there. And then um, essentially you should have been um, also contacted already by your analyst um, if you like, so they should have contacted you in like September, October to let you know who your assigned reviewer is and um, what your review timeline is looking like. Um, and then kind of just sort of big picture, remember that the year of the review for the SP administrative review is this current school year. So if you're if you're under review this year, they're gonna be looking at this year. They don't really go back unless you have just egregious kind of issues. 
But the only thing they do look back into the previously closed fiscal year is for resource management. So everything else, your claims, your menus, things like that, is typically limited in scope to the current year and even just like a subset of like weeks and a month or so of this year. So just kind of to get your brain wrapped around that. And when we think about the four steps um, or like the steps of the AR process, we like to break it down into four steps. So you have your offsite assessment, which is like a big, long questionnaire that you start with. It's about 75 questions that need to be answered very specifically and have specific attachments to them. And then you have your month of review. That's the month for which your claims are analyzed and your week of targeted menu review is in that month of review. And then you have the entrance visit. So your entrance visit is um, kind of, essentially it's like when your review starts, like that's what it used to be. But as you can see, it's like, you've already done a lot of prep work ahead because your offsite assessment is due before the entrance and your month of review happens before the entrance. But typically, historically, the entrance visit is when the state comes out and starts looking at a lot more of your paperwork. And then you have your corrective action. If you have any, we usually say like, if you, you know, it's always great to get a perfect audit. We've had lots of schools who have perfect audits. Um, but if you have a few findings, that's okay. It's realistic to have like two, three findings or maybe a little bit more if you're in a bigger district as well. Yeah, but I also feel like there's something missing here. What about on-site meal observation? Where does that fall into this four-step process? Yeah, so that kind of is, um, it's a little bit wonky. So it depends on your state and your reviewer. Um, so you've got these four steps and um, the on-site meal observation, it is traditionally, um, and you can see some little arrows on the next slide, like it's usually under USDA guidance, it would happen on that, like you would have an entrance visit and that's kind of used to be the first time you would see your auditor and they would come out at the entrance and then they would start doing their meal observations. And that's how it usually works in other states. California does things a little different, as we all know, um, like to keep us on our toes. So sometimes the California reviewers like to come out in advance and come in the month of review, which means your review just feels like it goes on forever because you've got the offsite assessment, you've got auditors there during the month of review, then you've got all this paperwork due during the entrance visit. So just check with your state and with your auditor to know when these things are happening. That's good to know. And looking at all the steps here, I do remember that there's a, a little bit of overlap uh, and it can be rather confusing to keep track of everything. So could you help us out by going over the AR timeline? Yeah, so kind of just putting this in a little bit different view. This is sort of like in a linear fashion, how this will look. So you get your announcements, your, you should like kind of narrow down your email, your dates, you know, email with your reviewer, get your dates ironed out. Then the next step is going to be your offsite assessment. And then you'll be looking at your month of review, your claims and your menus. On-site meal observation, like we said, a little bit of a wild card, kind of see, it could be during the month of review, could be during the entrance visit. The entrance visit is typically one to two months after the month of review. So you have to have time to file your claim for the month of review before the entrance visit, because you need that all filed first. Then your corrective action is due typically 30 days after like your entrance and exit happens, but it depends on what your auditor needs to give you 30 days to process corrective action. So if they don't get you your final report for a month after your entrance, then you still should have 30 days to file your corrective action. Got it. Well, since we don't know our specific AR timeline, how, how can we start to wrap our heads around this? You know, once I find out I'm under review, what should I focus on first? Yeah, so we like to kind of up start this whole audit process with some project management. And one of the first things about, you know, managing a big project like an AR is to get your dates straight and like then you can build out your customized timeline. So what we shared was just very general. Then you're going to want to, if you don't have all of this information that you see here on the screen, you're going to want to contact your reviewer and say, hey, when are these due dates? Make no assumptions, double check everything with them so that you have your timeline all kind of squared away. Um, and then we like to really put that front and center. So this is actually something we do with all of our clients is we create like a cover sheet that they can like print, laminate, 
throw on Google Calendar, throw in a project management system, but at minimum, you know, throw it on a chalkboard or a whiteboard in your office. Like these dates are super important that you can see here on the screen. So, you know, just put those front and center. Um, and then you'll also want to kind of think about, you know, once you have all your dates squared away, you're going to start gathering documentation and maybe delegating some of the aspects of the review. So think about how else you can be organized with your files. We do recommend putting everything on a Google Drive or a box or something like that for your own internal purposes. And that way you can look back at it later if you, you know, the next time you get an audit. Right now we're pulling documents from someone's last audit because we can just recycle some of the stuff that we did last time but it's much easier if you have it all in like a Google drive or something rather than building a physical box and not being able to edit those printed documents. So if you can keep all your digital files in one place, it'll make it so much easier to collaborate. It'll mean, you know, if you have to be home with a sick kid or something like that and emailing your reviewer, hopefully that doesn't happen to you, but you have access to your files from wherever you're at and your team can have access to those. So um, that's kind of some of our top tips and things that we do every day with our clients that we work with on audits. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of file organization and kind of getting a system on lock here, before we actually begin the process, is there anything new this year that people need to be aware of? Yeah, there's definitely new stuff. So we did a, a um, webinar on this topic a couple of months ago. So I don't want to be too repetitive in the interest of time, but we have a whole bunch of things listed here. So feel free to pop any questions in the chat. Um, one thing I did want to mention because CDE announced this yesterday on the town hall was there is a new requirement this year for Andator annual mandatory procurement training, but it's for this year. So you don't have to have procurement training done already. It's just that there was a regulatory update in the program integrity final rule about a year and a half ago that went into effect for two, school year 24-25 that all SFA's staff that has anything to do with procurement has to have some training on procurement. So we already have some great webinars that you can catch on our YouTube channel and on Lunch Assist Pro. And we also just got USDA approval for a four-part procurement series. That's really fun, like classic Lunch Assist style. Like it's actually fun to listen to. Um, so those videos are being recorded right now and edited. So those will be on your pro account. You'll have just like some short and sweet little procurement videos you can watch. So don't stress about the procurement training requirement if you're submitting AR documentation right now, because it's just that you need to have procurement training by the end of the school year. Um, and if you do want to get ahead of it before our videos are published, you can catch something from our YouTube channel or from your pro account. Um, it, it's no specificity about like what the regular, like the number of minutes or exactly the you know, training topic within procurement training. So we even have an ICN webinar we're doing next week on procurement. So you could join us for that as well. Um, so that's something I wanted to point out. The other thing is Buy American. So on the next slide, you can see that we are going to include a link to, if we can throw this in the chat, the um, federal exempt, uh, exceptions list. So this is actually something that makes your life a little easier when it comes to Buy American. So you can actually... Um, you don't have to provide exception documentation for foods that are on this pre-approved exception list, essentially. So things like bananas, canned mandarin oranges, olives, if those are coming from other countries, which they normally are, you don't have to provide any paperwork during your audit. So um, yeah, those are some of the things we wanted to point out here about what's new. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, you know, you're mentioning Buy American, but could you just go over again, you know, Buy American did also change with the final rule. So what goes into effect this year when it comes to Buy American? Yes. Yeah, so if you're under audit this year, and this, some of this might be different than your last audit or like if you're a new director or something, and then there's going to be new regulations on Buy American next year. So focusing just on school year 24, 25, um, if you're under audit this year, here's what you need to know. So you need to have um, documentation of an approved exception for any non-domestic foods that you're serving. So like I was just saying, you don't need it for things that are on the exceptions list. So bananas, don't worry about, you don't need to fill out anything if you have bananas because they're on the exception list. But let's say you have graham crackers from Canada, um, then you need to have a uh, a uh, Buy American exception form stating why you have those in your kitchen. Um, 
probably not the best use of a Buy American exception, but cherry tomatoes in January would be a great use of an exception form. And you fill out the form and you say, hey, we have cherry tomatoes January through March because they're not in sufficient supply in domestic, you know, domestically. So you have these Buy American exception forms. You can find them in your pro account. They're on CNIPs as well. Um, and then the other things you need to have is um, you, basically that's sort of a back office responsibility, right? Like get your forms on file, like in the office. And then we really want to work with our site staff to have everyone kind of keep an eye out for labels and country of origin labeling on packages that come into your storeroom, your freezer, your fridge, go through the freezer and fridge to check to see if there's like anything you know, that might have come in from like a catering event that's in your freezer and you're going to get dinged on if it says it's product of Canada. Um, so the auditor is going to do a storeroom observation and pull products from dry storage, cold storage, frozen, and a sampling of products. And they'll want to make sure that those items are all domestic or if they're non-domestic that you have your paperwork. So work with your site staff on that and your central warehouse if you have, you know, a central kitchen or something like that. You'll also need a copy of a bid that has Buy American language. And the other interesting thing is like, you don't need to have any paperwork for foods that you know are domestic. So don't worry about putting Buy American paperwork together for your whole food inventory. That would just take you ages and is not necessary. However, sometimes an auditor will pull something like canned corn. I literally had this happen to me last year. They pulled canned corn and they were like, prove to me that this is American. And we're like, it's corn. It comes from America. <laughs> and they're like, that's not good enough. So we had to like pull a bunch of paperwork from the, it was actually a USDA product. So we were able to just provide the USDA foods receipt. And they're like, cool, that's all good. But sometimes the domestic products, they might say they're inconclusive. And then you have to reach out to Gold Star or Cisco or whoever you're getting that food from and say, hey, can you give me something that says this was like made in Arkansas? Like I need to be able to show that to my auditor. So um, that's the inconclusive things that you don't really prepare for in advance, but might get thrown at you probably will. You'll probably get one of those. So just be wow. fair warning. <laughs> well, it, it also sounds like definitely need a lot of team effort here. Uh, I mean, you got site staff, central kitchen staff, managers, vendors, and of course the auditors. Um, but it also sounds like a lot of people to coordinate, you know, how do you make sure all that paperwork lines up? You know, who do you need to talk to? Who exactly do we need to coordinate for our AR? Yeah, so you're so right, Emma. It's a team effort. So um, I don't know of any district that can go through the AR just on their own. Um, at minimum, in California, you're going to have at least three or more people at CDE alone that you're going to have to coordinate. So it's not just one auditor. There's like at least three people that are managing different aspects of the AR. Now, in other states, it doesn't work like that. There are other states that have just one person, which is a dream. Um, but in California, it's at least three, sometimes more. So keep that in mind as you're communicating with CDE, you're going to have at least three contacts to manage. Then on your own internal team, kind of the same story. It, even if you're in a really tiny district with just one school, it's not usually going to be only the director. You're going to have, you know, a lot of coordination with our site staff. So make sure that you really get, um, you know, your site staff prepared and involved in the process. Um, and the main thing that your site staff is going to want to be involved with is the preparations for the on-site meal observation. So we have um, an on-site meal observation checklist that we'll throw in the chat for everyone who's joining us live. Um, this is normally just available in our boot camp, but I love this checklist. I use it like anytime I go to a a school, I um, I pull this checklist and bring it out there. And we've been meeting with a lot of clients and they've been bringing their site staff to our Zoom meetings. And we just kind of go through this checklist. There's also a video that you can watch in the boot camp to help prepare the site staff for like, what is the auditor going to ask me? And how am I going to like, you know, have everything, my signage, like all of my paperwork, how, what does it all have to look like at the individual school site? So this is a great place to start and get 
kind of everyone on board um, so that they know what to expect. And um, you can start pre-auditing your sites. And it's just, you know, something that you can kind of get started with anytime. It doesn't have to be close to when your meal observation is. You can you can get going on this one right now or even in a non-audit year. So I know some people on the call are joining because you want to be like prepared for future audits. I love this checklist for that. Like bring it out this year and say, hey, like in the future, we'll have an audit. So let's go through this maybe as a supplement to your site monitoring. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of coordinating each of our sites and meal observation, one of the big pieces that the reviewer will be looking at is our menus and the food. Um, but for this, I'd like to bring in our guest expert, Melissa Manning, into the ring here. Melissa, can you provide us with some tips and tricks around planning for a menu review? Absolutely. So the first thing that I love to share with people is I think we are all so scarred by nutrient analysis and how much work goes into that is that people think we still need to run a nutrient analysis. But especially in California, where we have uh, the dietary specifications assessment tool, plus many other states, we actually can just choose on question 600 of the OAT that you want to run a diet or do the dietary specifications assessment tool instead of a nutrient analysis. Now the dietary specifications assessment tool, though it is a very long word, is actually pretty simple to answer. And it's just questions like, do you have fryers in your kitchen? So that that's pretty, pretty straightforward. And it will determine if you're high or low risk. Most people turn out low risk, like almost everybody. And that means you don't have to run the analysis. Yay. So um, next, uh, you want to ask me the next yeah, one? Yeah, no, I, I just, I think that's such a hot take. People are going to absolutely be really happy about that. Um, but, you know, since we're looking at the meal components, I was wondering if you could talk us through some of the common issues or points of confusion you see with how people are calculating those meal components. Yes, it is definitely confusing how the regulation state we need to calculate the minimum meat and grain. So it, we have a handy chart here that helps explain that, but each for every entree offered on a menu, the reviewer or the USDA wants us to only count the smallest amount of meat and the smallest amount of grain that is offered over the day. So even if we offer some super big deluxe massive burrito stuffed with good stuff. It doesn't matter if we offer something smaller. That's all that they count. So we can see on Monday, we've got a one meat, one grain uncrustable on the menu. And it doesn't matter that the other entree is two meat, two grain. All that they're counting towards the minimum is one meat, one, one grain. And that's fine for the day, but that can add up quickly over a week. And on Wednesday, even though we have a one meat, two grain, item and a three meat, one grain item, they're still only counting one meat because that was the lowest amount of meat offered in an entree and one grain because that was the lowest amount of grain offered in an entree. So over a week, you can see it adds up to only six meat, six grain. And now this menu is out of compliance over a week. And I, I love tracking all of the AR findings. I've got them all on a giant spreadsheet. This is one of the top findings and the reason why. Mm, okay. Well, what about juice? Juice is always so confusing to me. How does that 50% juice work? Great question. Yeah. It, there's all sorts of theories that float around out there. And the reason is because it's actually a little bit complicated. Basically we're adding up fruit and juice, adding it together, doing some math and multiplying by a hundred and making a percentage. So um, that that's why is is because it's actually a percentage that's dependent upon the total amount of fruit and juice added up together over a week long period following this calculation at the bottom of the page. But if you want to just make it easy for everybody, just you could go along with like juice can be offered twice a week. You'll make that 50 percent uh, maximum. Yeah. But and it's really about like you know, the ratio between fruit and like whole fruit and fruit juice. So you could also do like fruit, you could do juice every day, right? If you wanted to, as long as you have an equal amount of fresh fruit compared to, so you have a half a cup of fresh fruit, half a cup of fruit juice offered, then you're not exceeding 50% because the rule is basically you can't have more than 50% juice over the course of the week. So 
just kind of keep that in mind. That's one that you've seen a lot, right? In your AR findings and like a lot of misconceptions on. Definitely. Uh, and especially, yeah, the misconceptions is, is the biggest uh, and people aren't sure. So, yeah. Right. Well, you know, you mentioned that spreadsheet of all the findings that you, that you find the most of. Um, what else are you seeing people getting the most findings on? Wow. Well, menu planning findings are some of the top findings, like the most frequent findings on AR every single year. Uh, but I'll just mention a couple. You can read up on this afterwards, and the slides will be available. Uh, the first one is we're rolling into winter. We're putting mandarin oranges and kiwis on the menu. Just remember that most of the time they're not going to fulfill the half cup requirement for offer versus serve. And serving two or offering two and having kids take that is really, really hard to get everybody to fall into line with. So that is one of them. And then the second one is that I, I see a lot where we're counting, we have a chicken Caesar salad along with a bunch of other entrees offered. And we want to count that chicken Caesar, uh, all that romaine lettuce towards our dark green. So um, the rule actually states, and these are in a lot of findings, that veggie subgroups must be offered to all students, regardless of the entree that's chosen. So if I choose a Caesar salad as an entree and I, um, or if I choose a pizza as an entree instead of a Caesar salad, that means I can't get my dark green. And that ends up being a shortage over the week that there's not dark green offered to all students, regardless of what entree they take. So those mm. are the top two. All right. And speaking of menus, I'd like to actually talk about the documentation that's required. Cool. All right. Well, I'll be in touch. Thank All you. right. Um, what exactly do people need to gather? What documentation do we need to prepare? Yeah, so I can start with this one because we have a really lovely checklist um, that we will throw in the chat for those of you joining us live. Um, so again, this is another boot camp resource um, that uh, we just wanted to, to give you. Um, and Really, this menu documentation menu documentation checklist is um, kind of going to go over the menus, the production records, the recipes, your labels and product formulation sheets, and the menu compliance worksheet with a little bit of like tips on exactly what to look for when you prepare each of those items. So um, those that's kind of the big picture of what you need to provide for your week of targeted menu review. And then also potentially the day of on-site meal observation, if that on-site meal observation doesn't take place during the week. So that's where you can see on this checklist, it gives you the opportunity to, again, get those dates straight so you kind of know what you're looking at. Um, and then go through and see, okay, what documents do I need to prepare for the week? And what documents do I need to have ready for my day of observation? Um, one thing that we do want to dig into a little bit more on this there's so much we could talk about, but um, the menu compliance worksheet in particular um, always raises a few questions. So Melissa, can you tell us a little bit more about this menu compliance worksheet? I know you've done a couple of these in your day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can do them almost with my eyes closed. Uh, they're they're quite the quite the thing, all these tabs on an Excel spreadsheet, or if your software will make them, that's great too. Now, whenever I'm looking at documentation, I hate to see red. <laughs> Immediately, it's just a trigger or orange, like uh, warning, warning. So, but it's okay on this documentation uh, in, in this menu compliance worksheet that if it's red or orange on the maximums, then they're not even going to discuss that or ask a question about that. That is A-OK. -okay. So that's the good news. Um, and then also good news, I love good news, is that we can ignore the tab called the Simplified Nutrient Assessment. That's the last tab in this big spreadsheet. And if you have menu planning software, I typically take the nutrient analysis out of the packet. So it'll export a PDF. I remove those pages and don't give them stuff that they don't need to look at. And that's because, again, going back to what we were sharing about earlier, is that you're gonna choose to do the dietary specifications assessment tool, 
in question 600 on the out and not have to run any of that analysis. They honestly don't really want to see it. So that's the good news. Yeah. And, then, and so, oh, oh okay. so sorry to interrupt, Melissa. I was going to say, so just to kind of digest this. So this screenshot here is the USDA worksheet. So someone could do the USDA worksheet or they could pull a similar looking report, probably a little bit prettier version um, from their nutrient analysis software. But it's going to include essentially the same details as this USDA worksheet. But what they don't have to have, as long as they trigger as low risk on the dietary specifications assessment tool in the offset assessment, they shouldn't have to do a nutrient analysis. So you don't need calories, saturated fat, things like that. You can pull those out. That's what you're saying. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yay. Cool. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I have another set of good news on the next slide. And in the, so like, there's some things that I'm always into celebrating when we can, right? And this is an AR, it's like relieving some of the pressure. They, they don't give you bonus points for your menu being beautiful, complicated, all from scratch. There's no scoring on that. So you could focus on simpler items if you choose, offer things that are single unit, the classic is like the corn dog or something instead of a super complicated recipe where there needs to be a Which lot of we would normally not recommend, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we're just right. saying make yeah. your life easy during the audit and do you all your scratch cooking on other weeks. <laughs> That's right. That's right. If you choose up to yeah. you. Now if you do choose to put on a complex recipe with a lot of creditable ingredients then uh, the reviewer will go and calculate the, how all of the meal pattern adds up through that recipe. And sometimes we'll ask you questions. How do you justify these numbers? So um, corn dogs is just a product formulation statement or CN label, uh, which is it's much simpler. And again, no bonus points for complicated recipes uh, at all in the audit. And then the second little thing is, um, that you only need to provide spec sheets, product formulation sheets or CN labels for creditable ingredients in your packet. So that means no ketchup packets, no sauces, unless they're creditable, no seasoning mixes or anything like that. They're just trying to, the, in the audit, the packet is just justifying your creditable meats and grains, fruits and vegetables for your processed products. So those are my two, let's make it easy tips. Yeah. And, and kind of, go oh, ahead. sorry, I'm, I'm just chiming in here. Um, so one thing that I wanted to ask you, Melissa, is regarding like in California, the freshly prepared on-site meals, because I know a lot of people have been wondering if that's part of the AR this year. Are they looking at your compliance with, you know, yeah. your 40% scratch okay. cooking? Hmm, what do I really, no, no, they're, they're really not, that's not part of, the USDA's official AR. So they are required to just follow that. And you'll be, if you haven't already turned in your justification for your uh, kit funds, then um, that's a separate thing altogether. Yeah. So they're not wrapping that into the AR, which is good. So don't stress about like, again, do your scratch cooking if that's what you're doing. We're not saying to change your menus like just for the audit. But if you have a mix of like, heat and serve and scratch and speed scratch, it might be good to look at your menus and just make your life a little easier and put some of your more heat and serve items on your week of review because it's just going to make your documentation so much easier and low risk and you have so much more to deal with with the audit. So, and then if you are doing scratch recipes, just be really cautious about making sure you calculate all your components, check them twice. Um, be really diligent because they will do all that math. And if you're off just by a tiny bit, you could have a major issue with your menu compliance. Yeah, and it's okay to offer more, just not under the minimums. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Wow, thank you both so much. There's so much juicy tips in this webinar. I'm really excited for people to get these slides so they can refer back to it. Um, remember folks, we still have an open Q&A at the end. So if you wanna have any questions answered now, please pop those into the chat. Now, shifting gears a little bit, Jen, I know you also really wanted to talk about resource management. It's one of those areas that takes the longest to prepare on the AR. What do people need to know about that Section 700 resource management review? 
Yeah, so I did want to take a few moments just to talk about resource management. So everyone will have to complete the resource management section of the review. Um, it's done in the offsite assessment. Um, if you're part of the boot camp, you can download like the section 700 video and our kind of templated answer key as a guide. Um, but just yeah, be a little careful about how you answer this, because depending on how you answer everything, you can trigger yourself for a comprehensive resource management review. Now, that being said, you can see there's four sections, um, the four bullet points that you can see here on the screen, the nonprofit school food service account, paid lunch equity, non-program food revenue, and indirect costs. If you trigger for a comprehensive resource management review in non-program food revenue or indirect costs, it's really no big deal. Everyone who has non-program foods and everyone who has any indirect costs being charged to their program will trigger for a comprehensive in non-program food revenue and indirect costs. And it doesn't mean much. It just means you have to provide a little bit more documentation. It's honestly, it's, it's really easy. So um, and we'll talk about non-program food again in just a moment. But be really cautious about the first, I think it's question 700 through 704, maybe 705. The, the first few questions um, can trigger you for a comprehensive in the nonprofit school food service account. Now, sometimes there's nothing you can do about that. Like you, you have to answer these, you know, honestly to what your program is, but just be really careful about how you answer those. Cause if you get a comprehensive in the nonprofit school food service account, it's kind of like the scarlet letter and you have this A for audit that could potentially continue to trigger you year after year. Once you start getting nonprofit comprehensive in the nonprofit school food service account, you may get triggered every year because it's just the way it works. And, and it's a huge in-depth fiscal audit of your general ledger and every single expense for your program. So um, yeah, just fair warning there. <laughs> um, and um, definitely reach out if you have any questions and be really careful about how you answer those questions. I did notice someone put in the chat that like this year CDE is not letting people go back and change their answers to the OAT once you submit. Um, I think they were never really supposed to do that. So um, they're enforcing that now. So once you send in your answers, that's it. So be really careful about when you go into CNIPs or in if, you're in another, uh, if you're in another state, how you um, answer those and make sure that you, you know, you answer them in the best way possible. So um, yeah, that's my <laughs> words to the wise. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's all really good to know. And you hinted at non-program food revenue here. We've had a lot of folks asking about non-program food revenue, especially in California with Universal Meals. Universal Meals is actually throwing off people's calculations for non-program food. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on here and how people can bring their non-program food revenue into compliance? Yes. So, um, Non-program foods is like anytime you're selling anything a la carte, you've got your second meals, um, adult meals, catering, vending, like maybe vending to the after school program or vending to a external entity. Um, if you just do adult meals, this you don't really have to deal with this. But if you have or like I think it's adult meals and milk, you can kind of just get you don't have to do too much. But if you have catering, if you have a la carte you're gonna to have to go through this non-program food revenue tool. So again, if you, it's like offsite assessment question 709, if you answer yes, you will trigger for a comprehensive in this section, which just means you have to provide a bunch of backup about how you calculated this tool and you need to show if you're in compliance with this USDA tool. If you're out of compliance with this USDA tool, you have to raise your prices. So the problem here is that a couple of things. So this, this tool, now you can kind of see the USDA tool on the right, and you can see a little bit of a calculation here. Um, this is a little bit hard to fill out because we all know our total food costs. That's on our unaudited actuals. We know our total revenue for the year. And in fact, we even know our total non-program food revenue because we can pull those numbers from our point of sale system or from our accounting system. Hey, how much catering did we did? Oh, we did $30,000 in catering. Cool. So you can get those numbers, but what's really hard is when you look at your total food cost, unless you're itemizing out invoices, it's really hard to know the food cost, you know, from 
your program versus your non-program. So what we've developed, and we'll share this with you, and this is also a new resource on Lunch Assist Pro. We're just really excited to send it out. We've been using this for a couple of years with our clients, and now it's a pro resource that we've like tried and true we want to share with everyone. So this is a, a second tab on the USDA non-program food revenue tool that you can actually use to calculate your non-program food revenue based on your meal equivalents for the year. So this is a tool you can use if you're struggling to actually get the numbers that need to go into the the USDA tool on the right. So it'll auto calculate it. You just enter your meals that you serve during the year and your total revenue and your total food costs, and it'll kind of do the math for you. So that's something really helpful. We'll send that out in the chat um, and in the email. Um, a couple other pointers. So one thing, and if you're from another state, just put earmuffs on because this is not super accurate from a federal standpoint. But um, in California, they are telling people that you can actually exclude catering from the non-program food revenue tool. So that's one way if you're just completely out of compliance with the tool we were just looking at, take out your catering revenue and your catering food costs. And that might bring you into compliance. And you can fact check that with your reviewer because like, again, it doesn't really align with even CDE's own website, <laughs> um, but they're just emailing people and telling them that. So yeah, passing that along. Um, and then also if you're still just like, oh my gosh, I'm so out of compliance with non-program foods, what can I do? Email your analyst um, who's helping you with section 700 because we haven't seen this yet, but we've heard about it. Um, it's called the Non-Program Food Universal Meals Adjustment Form. And essentially what's happening is because you have so much additional revenue from state funds, this is actually throwing some people out of compliance because your a la carte and your catering revenue may not have kept up with the increase in the other state funds. So it's just, it's throwing off all your calculations. Um, so they have a little bit of an adjustment form they can help you with. So hopefully you can kind of resolve this with some of these little tricks and it's just working a little differently than it used to. Oh my goodness. This is so helpful. Thank you, Jen and Melissa. Um, before we wrap up and open it to Q and A, uh, this next question I'm actually going to take to help close us out with one final tip on professional standards. A lot of you on the call today are Lunch Assist Pro members, so thank you. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that with Lunch Assist Pro, we have a professional standards tracking tool. So if you are a pro member, don't forget that we do have this handy dandy AR compliance report that you'll want to run. For folks that are not yet pro members, definitely hit up my guy, Mike, and schedule a chat with him. Speaking of Mike, I'll pass it back to you. Hey, Emma. Yeah, thanks, everybody. We really appreciate your, your time today. Like Emma said, we're going to get here to the Q&A in, in one minute. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's aware, um, like uh, just to, to kind of reiterate, if you're not already a pro member, um, please reach out to me. Uh, somebody can pop my email address into the chat for me real quick. I'd love to talk to you more about uh, different options that we have as far as the memberships go. We also have built into our uh, pro website uh, the ability to add on the um, AR Bootcamp, which is a super helpful tool when going through your AR. And if you're looking for that, that true one-on-one -on -one service, please reach out to us about uh, uh, potentially working with one of our consultants. Um, happy to talk to you about our consulting packages, um, and that's one of the things that's covered. We will assist you one-on-one -on -one through your entire AR process. So. Um, really excited about that. So if anybody's interested, please reach out to me. Uh, lastly, um, if you can, uh, I want to uh, talk about um, uh, Melissa real quick. Um, if you can flip to the next slide for me, thank you. Um, please reach out to Melissa. If you scan that little QR code right there, she'll give you a free consult. Uh, so please reach out to her if you guys are interested in that as well. I'm going to turn it right back over to Emma so she can get started with the Q&A for us. Thanks.